My name is Irene Kaplow. I am a Lane Postdoctoral Fellow in the Fenning Lab at Carnegie Mellon University, and I would like to thank the organizers of Recom Regulatory and Systems Genomics for inviting me to present my work. The work I will be presenting today was a joint effort between me and Daniel Schaefer, a fantastic undergraduate in the Fenning Lab. The project I will be describing is identifying enhancers associated with mammalian phenotypes that evolve through gene expression. Our many interesting phenotypes, including vocal learning in mammals and birds, have been shown to have evolved at least in part through gene expression. And what I mean by this is that the differences we see between species are due to differences in regulatory elements involved in determining when genes are expressed. Many genomes have recently been sequenced in many different mammals, enabling us to study evolution in unprecedented ways. However, studying gene expression evolution remains a challenge because most regulatory elements act in ways that are tissue specific, meaning that we need to assay them in different tissues in many species, and we cannot actually obtain most tissues in most species. Thus, what our lab set out to do is to identify open chromatin regions, which serve as a proxy for regulatory elements in tissues in a few species, and then use those open chromatin regions and the orthologs in other species of data that are not open to train a convolutional neural network that predicts whether an ortholog of an open chromatin region is open and then use that convolutional neural network to make predictions of the open chromatin status of these open chromatin regions throughout the mammalian phylogeny. The data was generated by Morgan Worthlin, Alyssa Lawler, and Ashley Brown, and supplemented with public data. We found that our models worked well, not only overall, but also on specific tasks that were designed specifically to study models for gene expression evolution. This includes our models working well on clade-specific open chromatin orthologs, species-specific open chromatin orthologs, and tissue-specific open chromatin regions. In addition, we took our mouse open chromatin regions and identified their orthologs, and then we took, that, we took the average prediction across their orthologs. And what we found is that the orthologs in the species closely related to mouse tend to have an average that was high, and that this average decreased as we got further from mouse. In addition, we found that our predictions tend to be more accurate in predicting whether open chromatin will be conserved than conservation scores. We investigated some specific examples where our models worked better than conservation scores. And one of these examples is this open chromatin region in mouse liver whose ortholog is open in macaque and our model predicted its openness correctly. Although this region in general has very low conservation. There's a small region within it that is highly conserved, and that region has the motif for CTCF. We think that our model was able to get this right because when interpreting our model, we found that one of the things our liver model learned was the motif for CTCF. So our model was able to automatically identify that this short region was important for open chromatin, even though the conservation overall was low and thus using average conservation scores would not have made such an accurate prediction. In addition, this open chromatin region is near the gene RxRA. RxRA is a transcription factor that has been shown to play an important role in lipid metabolism. In addition, our models also learned that the RxRA motif is important for predicting liver open chromatin. Now that we have our open chromatin predictions, we wanted to try to study them in a systematic way. So what we did is we created a matrix where in each row we have an open chromatin region and each column we have its ortholog in a different species and our values are our predictions. So in green we have um, predictions of closed chromatin and in blue we have predictions of open chromatin and then if we see gray that means that we were not able to find a usable ortholog. We then took this matrix and used this to create clusters of open chromatin regions based on the predictions of their orthologs open chromatin status. Here you can see a couple of our clusters. In this brain cluster, we see that the orthologs are predicted to be open in primates, in cetaceans, and in ungulates, but not in other mammals. In this liver cluster, we see that the orthologs are predicted to be open in primates and carnivora, but not in other mammals. Thus, these open chromatin regions in these clusters may be involved in convergent evolution. Now that we have shown 
that some of our open chromatin regions have likely interesting evolutionary patterns of open chromatin status, we wanted to associate these patterns with phenotypes that our lab is interested in. But we wanted to do it in a way we can make sure that our association was stronger than what we get just based on the phylogenetic tree. Thus, what we are doing is for continuous phenotypes, we're using a method called phylogenetic generalized least squares, and for categorical phenotypes, we're using a method called phylogenetic ANOVA. If you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them at this conference or via email.